Okay. Well, I did have yak and snack and grace and salt before um, when we when we were still meeting as All Seasons Baptist Church before we shut that down. Mm -hmm. We had grace and salt, and in Kansas City we had yak and snack because that was fun. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've I've spoken to ladies lots of times, but every time makes me nervous. When I got ready to go to college, and I was looking at what major I wanted to be, if you had to take speech, I was not going to be that <laughs> because I was not going to take speech. Then when I finally took speech, it wasn't so bad, but uh, it terrified me. Um, first off, my husband asked me to give a short testimony here today because it was 14 years ago today. I had been in the hospital for maybe 13 days. And, uh, but I'd been sick since June. About the middle of June that year, I started throwing up every day. And I went to the doctor, they did a procedure on me, nobody could figure out what was wrong with me. They finally sent me to Iowa City in August. And the doctor there wanted to do surgery, but she wanted some of my old surgical reports. Because when you've had, at that point, I had had 13 surgeries. So she wanted to know what she was getting into. And um, they never came and they never came. Well, December the 1st, my family went to church that morning because I couldn't even hold down water. And uh, when they came home, my daughters turned around and looked at my husband and they said, I don't know what you're doing, Dad, but one of us is taking her to the hospital. So they took me to the hospital and uh, they took me by ambulance to Iowa City, which we were like, well, can't you just like let us drive there? And they were like, uh, no, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, I had endometriosis and the endometriosis had formed endometrium tumors throughout my abdomen, the largest ones. There were about six of them. Two of them were about the size of grapefruits. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were bleeding into themselves and had been for this whole time. And so my uh, between Monday morning when I got to Iowa City, because I was in the ER all night, Sunday night, between Monday morning when I got to Iowa City and Friday when they finally did my hysterectomy, they gave me seven units of blood trying to get me ready for surgery. During the surgery, they had to give me six more units of blood. And in ICU afterwards, they had to give me four more units of blood. So I had all new blood. Um, I don't think it helped. But, <laughs> but um, so that was December 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, the 6th, I had surgery. On the 13th, they came, they had just let me start eating. Now, I hadn't eaten in 13 days. Mm -hmm. So they let me, gave, gave me a meal. That e evening, they came in to do something. I needed to get up and go to the bathroom. And on the way to the bathroom, I collapsed. So they, and threw up. And they ran a bunch of tests and came in and started unplugging me and wheeling me into the hall. Mm -hmm. This was on a Wednesday evening. And uh, I asked them what was going on. And my doctor, who was actually a resident, but she's the greatest doctor I've ever had, she said, well, your bowel has perforated and you are septic. Mm -hmm. So we have to do emergency surgery to repair your bowel. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, and I looked down and it was 7.20 on Wednesday night. And I knew that my husband was in the pulpit taking prayer request. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed my cell phone and I called him. And I said, Mark, they're wheeling me into surgery. Um, you know, ask, ask the church to pray for me, but you need to stay through the service mm -hmm. because they need to know that we're okay. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he said, okay. But then my doctor took the phone away from me and said something to him. And I don't know what she said. Because we got upstairs and got all ready to have the surgery. And she called him again. And she talked to him for a few minutes. And then she handed me the phone. And what I was to find out later was that she basically told him, tell her goodbye. Because oh my, my situation, I had about a 5 to 7% chance of survival. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. I was too dumb to know that. But uh, <laughs> I spent several more days in ICU. I spent, and that was in December. I got out of the hospital on Christmas Eve only because the nurse didn't tell anybody that I was still throwing up. <laughs> but I was okay. It was just, mm -hmm. you know, the, I was on so many medications. Mm -hmm. I had had so many antibiotics pumped into my body that I had five fungal infections, mm -hmm. including one in my bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So I had to go on, home on a pick line. I had a IV in my arm that I had to give myself antifungal bags of medicine twice a day. Had nurses coming to visit me. I had, it was a big mess. Um, and I was bedridden until about June that year. And then I got up and started moving again. And here I am, 14 <laughs> years later. Mm -hmm. So... Um, every year when we hit this point, I, I think, you know, that should have been it. Mm -hmm. So every moment I've had since then mm -hmm. has just been grace. And, 
I know. I, yeah, I'm too mean. I'm too ornery and mean. I'm telling you. I've had a stroke <laughs> when I was four. <laughs> I had uh, encephalitis when I was three. Um, I had several concussions as a teenager because I was an idiot mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> got myself into situations. But um, so, yeah, it's a wonder that I'm even functional, let alone, you know. Well, I don't know that I am any more than functional. But anyway, <laughs> we are going to start tonight in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, with the genealogy of Joseph. And I'm actually going to read all 17 verses of the genealogy. I'm going to go on someplace with you. Don't you hate it when you're in your Bible reading and then you get to those names? Oh. Really, Lord, i got to read this today. I'm having a bad day already, and you're going to make me read who's it and how's it and how's it. <laughs> but there is a lot in this genealogy. It says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Pharez and, and Zerah of Tamar, Samar, and Pharez begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram. And Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And Solomon begat... Robo, Rehoboam, it says Rehoboam there, and Rehoboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asak, and Asa begat Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat Jotham, and Jotham begat Azkaz, can you tell I went to Bible college, <laughs> and uh, Azkaz begat <laughs> Ezekias, and Ezekias begat Manassas, and Manassas begat Amon, and Amon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconias, and his brethren, about the time they were carried away to ba Babylon, and after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias beget Salathiel, and Salathiel beget Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel beget Abiad, and Abiad beget Eliakim, and Eliakim beget Azor, and Azor beget Sadak, and Sadak beget Achim, and Achim beget Iliad, and Iliad beget Eleazar, and Eleazar beget Mathen, and Mathen beget Jacob, and Jacob beget Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So... All the generations of Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away of Bab into Babylon, from Babylon into Christ, are 14 generations. I always find it amazing how God times things perfectly. It's just mind-boggling that, that it was 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. And he knew ahead of time that that was going to be the case. So now we're going to flip back. And we're going to study something that came up in this here genealogy. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 38. And I am going to read. Uh, let's see. Yep, I'm going to read all 30 verses of Genesis chapter 28. I know, it's a lot. And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adulamite whose name was Hera. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua and took her and went into her. And she conceived and bare a son and called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bare a son and she called his name Onan. And she yet conceived again and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Chesbiz when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And, and this comes like in the middle of talking about Joseph and everything that's going on in Egypt. And all of a sudden we jump back to Judah. So it's kind of an inserted chapter here. And uh, Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go into thy brother's wife and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Now, all right, Tamar's already had two husbands get killed by God. This is kind of like... You know, at this point, you're thinking, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> then said Judah unto Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house, till Sheila, my son, be grown. For he said, lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. So Judah's like, I don't know, God could kill that one too, so why don't you just go wait at your dad's house, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> and Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. And in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. 
And Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shearers in Tenmath, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnah, Nath to shear his sheep. And she put off her widow's and she put her widow's garments off from her, and covered her with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath, for she saw, saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given him to wife. Now, why is that important? Because Tamar had already been married, and so without seed, she had no inheritance in in the people. She would just be a beggar. And when Judah saw her. He thought her to be a harlot because she'd covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go I go to, I pray thee, let me come into thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will thou give me that thou mayest come into me? She said, What are you going to pay me? Because she was playing the harlot at this point. And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? And he said, Well, what pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet, thy bracelets, and thy staff that's in thy hand. And he gave it her, and came into her, and she conceived by him. And she arose and went away, and laid by her veil from her, and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend the Adulamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. He said, I want you to take this kid down to this harlot that's down there on the road to Timnath. Give her the kid, and get my ring, and my signet, and my staff back. And uh, and but he found her not. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of that place said, There was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. And it came to pass, about three months after that, that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, has played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. He was going to kill her. And she was brought forth. She sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are am I with child. And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose these are, this signet and bracelets and staff. Now, you know, at that point, Judith, it's like, oh, no. <laughs> these, one of the things I think we forget when we read the Bible is that these are real people going through their real daily lives. They're just like us, you know. And Judah acknowledged them and said, she had been more righteous than I because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son. And he knew her again no more. And it came to pass at the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon it his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. But he, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Pharez. And afterwards came out his brother that had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was Zerah. So she had twins and Zerah's hand came out first, but then Pharez pushed past it and came. This is all painful, is it not? <laughs> I mean, I want you. Oh, and there was no medicine in those days. There was no Lamaze classes. <laughs> there was none of this. She just had this baby. So that's Tamar's story. We're going to skip forward and we're going to read just a few verses of Ruth's story. Nope, Rahab first. Joshua chapter 2. You know the story. The spies came in, and they were searching out Jericho. And uh, at night, let's see. Rahab, the harlot, hid them in her house. Verse 3 says, in the king, uh, chapter 2, chapter 2, the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they come to search out the country. And the women, woman took the two men and hid them, and said, There came not men unto me. There came men unto me, but I went not where they were. In other words, they left. And it came to pass about the time of shuttling, shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I want not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. 
but she had brought them to the roof of her house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them on the way to Jordan under the fords. As soon as they pursued after them, which were gone out, they shut the gate. Now, then Rahab makes the spies promise her. She says, let me find a good verse here. Verse 10, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. She said, Now, therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you also will show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. And they said, Well, when we come to attack the city, anybody that's in your house, your get everybody in your, your, that you want to save in your house, and this cord that you're going to let us down with tonight, drop that cord out the window, and we'll know that's your house and we'll save you alive. So they did. And where's my other verse? Chapter 6, verse 17. Well, let me go down a little. Ah, verse 17. And the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are in therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And verse 26 said, uh, and Joshua jured them. No, that's not the one I want. Oh, 25. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day when Joshua was written. Because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. It's going to become important in a minute. I'm not just like finding random verses, I promise. <laughs> Turn to Ch Ruth chapter 4. that's not there <laughs> chapter 4 verse 10 says this is Boaz when he bought the the next of kin for Ruth moreover Ruth the Moabitess the wife of Malon have I purchased to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of the place ye are witness today now, let's see. Verse 12, he says, And let thy house be like the house of Pharez, who Tamar mar bear unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. And verse 13 and 14, So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the name of the Lord, which has not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name be famous in Israel. And then... Verse 18, all of a sudden, Pharez comes up again. Now, we don't know why, but it says, Now, these are the generations of Pharez. Pharez beget Hezron, and Hezron beget Ram, and Ram beget Abinadab, and Abinadab beget Nashon, and Nashon beget Salmon, and Salmon beget Boaz. That's who just got married. And Boaz beget Obed. That was their son that Ruth had. And Obed beget Jesse, and Jesse beget David. We're going to, we only have one more. We're going to look at Bathsheba. 2 Samuel, chapter 11. You know what happens in this story. David, at the time when the kings were supposed to go out to battle, David stayed home. And he saw Bathsheba taking a bath on the roof of her house. And people say, well, she shouldn't have been out there. But that's where they bathed. Mm -hmm. They didn't have indoor plumbing. And David wasn't supposed to be where he was in order to see her. She wasn't out there flaunting anything. She was just taking a bath. But David saw her. The king calls and says, hey, come to my house. I need you. You went because he could kill you. <coughs> and uh, she conceived and sent and told David, this is verse 5 of Second Samuel 11, and said, I am with child. So turn over to Second Samuel 12. We're going to look at verse 24. Nathan, Nathan the prophet comes and tells David of his sin with Bathsheba because he went on to have her husband killed. How many women in these stories had their husbands die? 
Ruth lost Malon. Tamar lost two husbands, then didn't get the third one. And then that was a big mess. Um, that was Rahab. Oh, Rahab was a harlot, which means there was no husband, you know. Uh, Ruth lost her husband, and now Bathsheba's lost her husband and is with King David. But David had her husband killed, and now they have this son. And Nathan said, the child which you have is going to die. And David mourned, but the child still died. And in verse 24 of 2 Samuel 12, it said, that David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her, and lay with her, and she bare a son. And he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Now, <laughs> quick side story. There's a family in Ohio that put up a cross in their Christmas decorations in their yard. And their HOA came in and told them they had to take the cross down. Because the cross had nothing to do with Christmas. Mm -hmm. The cross has everything to do. that no, they haven't taken it down. But the cross has everything to do with Christmas. Because without the cross, there would have been no Christmas. There, there would have been no reason for Jesus to come in human form to the earth. Being a woman... The women of Christmas have always drawn my attention. The first year, I've only had one newborn. Wendy was 17 hours old when we adopted her. And she was born in October. So at Christmas, she was still tiny. And to sit there and think of everything that had to be going through Mary's heart and mind. To have had an angel tell you you were going to have a baby when you'd never been with a man. Okay, you're already a little fruited out, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know... I understand that in their culture, they knew this would happen. But in our, you know, in our Christian culture, we know the rapture is going to happen. But when it does, it's going to be like shocking. <laughs> you know, we're going to be doing whatever we're doing. We could be sitting here and then all of a sudden we're in heaven. Mm -hmm. You ever wondered about that when you're sinning? Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, I always thought, oh, I do not want to be yelling at my dad when I get raptured into heaven. <laughs> and another Oh, hi, Lord. <laughs> that would have been horrible, you know. But um, I held that little baby and wondered at everything that Mary had to have been experiencing, knowing that this child was born of her, but it was also born of the Holy Spirit. And it says that Mary hid these things and pondered them in her heart, and I'm sure she pondered a lot. And I don't think Mary was the only one at the birth of Jesus because if we, as a community knew that some little girl was out in the stable having a baby, every one of us women would want to go see what we could do to help. And I'm sure there were little women, and in their culture, there were midwives, and there were all those things, and Jerusalem was full, and everybody would have known everything that was going on because it was full. And I think a bunch of little women were out there scurrying about and helping her boiling water, whatever they did in those days. I don't know. But then, if you're one of those women who's gone out to help this woman have this little baby, and all of a sudden, all the shepherds start coming in, <laughs> telling you that this angel just sang out there in the field and told you to come find this baby, that's got to be freaky too, right? <laughs> There's so many things about the Christmas story that when we just look at it in a little nativity set, we don't think about. But this was all a real happening uh, you know, my husband always laughs about those being the third shift shepherds. But <laughs> they were probably the youngest of the shepherds mm -hmm. because the old men went in to go to bed and left the boys out in the field to watch the sheep. And I, with my boys, I can't imagine if a bunch of angels appeared to them doing anything. <laughs> I just, the, the thought is, completely escapes me. But all these women that we've just went through their little stories in the Old Testament, have something in common. First off, they are all the only four women that are mentioned in the genealogy of Christ. Tamar was mentioned because Judah beget Perez of Tamar. And then it talks about how um, who did, Rahab beget Obed. I didn't realize that Rahab was, um, would have been Ruth's, no, oh, did Rahab beget Boaz? Let me get there and make sure, because I was looking at this going, wow, that's kind of awesome. Let's see, yeah, Rahab beget Boaz, and Boaz beget Obed. Boaz's mother was Rahab, and so Ruth's mother-in-law now was 
Rahab the harlot. That's, you know, we, we lose relationships when we just skip through stories and we don't tie them together. Um, so Ruth knew Rahab. Of course, she had Naomi, too, as, as her. The way they passed property on, Naomi would have still been her mother-in-law. But, you know, practically, Rahab was also her mother-in-law. And uh, they knew one another. Um, and then Bathsheba, who was going about her business and got pulled into this big old massive mess, and her baby died. And then she had another baby, and that baby was in the lineage of Christ. All four women were grandmothers of Jesus. All four of them were husbands or never was or had taken, been taken advantage of. All four of them had. Rahab was a harlot. Tamar had played the harlot in order to get any kind of care for herself. Um, Ruth, her, her husband died, and she left her people to go to Israel with Naomi and was a, was a foreigner and pretty much an outcast. Um, they were all left wondering who to believe or what to believe or even if they should believe. They had all had hard things happen to them. And I'm sure they wanted to give up. But Jesus claims each and every one of them as his grandmothers. And he made a point, you know, nobody, none of the other mothers were put in here. But those four mothers were put in there. And all four of them have what we would call hard luck stories. You know? Um, they were the outsider. We then there's us, the outsiders. The, uh, be good if I could read my writing, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the failures, the wounded, the broken, the weary. I don't know about you, but I probably have as many days as I as not that I think, man, I don't even know what I'm doing. I have no idea how I'm doing this, what I'm supposed to do next, what, you know, I, I, I've told my boys before, I feel like the absolute worst Christian on the planet and why God made me a pastor's wife. I do not know. <laughs> and I've done this. He's been a pastor now for more than 30 years, which I'm not that old. I, I guess I was very, very young. <laughs> but um, we all feel that way. But Jesus, not only did he claim these women to show us that it, it could have been any of us. They weren't special. But Jesus still claimed them. And he claims us that same way. He gives us his family name. He give, gave us his righteousness. I mean, what else, what more could anyone give us than his righteousness? So when I stand before God and I'm like, Lord, I'm sorry, I just have no idea. And the Lord looks at me and goes, all I see is Jesus. That's all I see. So, you know, what are you fussing about? There's a song that says, what sins are you talking about? When I go to the Lord and tell him about my sins, and he says, what sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. The only thing God forgets in the whole Bible is our sins. Buried in the deepest sea that we still have not been able to explore. I am going too fast. My mouth. But I want you to remember at this Christmas season, those grandmothers of Jesus and how it could have been any one of us because they weren't anything special. They just were women trying to make their way through a much harder culture than ours is, especially for women. You had no place, you had no nothing. If something happened to my husband, I could go on. I could have property. I, my van is actually in my name. It's the first vehicle in my life I've had in my name. And uh, wouldn't phase me a bit. I mean, would, I mean property-wise. <laughs> Culturally, would it phase me a lot? Yes, y'all probably be scraping me up off the floor. But um, he has a condition called supraventricular tachycardia, which is a benign condition. It's benign supraventricular tachycardia. And uh, <laughs> it was initiated by stress. Imagine that. You adopt nine kids and have stress. But 
he had several episodes of what is called broken heart syndrome. Um, the kids would do things that he just, it overwhelmed him. And every time we had to take him to the hospital on an ambulance because we thought he was having a heart attack. It, and it, that's why it's called broken heart syndrome. It's what happens to somebody if they drive up on an accident and realize it's their family or something like that. That happened to him three different times. And then after that, he would have times when he would feel like he was having a heart attack. Even an EKG would register false information. They did a bunch of tests on him. He had several procedures and they finally came to this benign supraventricular tachycardia. And basically what happens is the upper, the ventricle in his heart, not the uh, aorta, goes into um, tachycardia, which won't kill him. It won't damage his heart or anything like that. But it mimics physically a heart attack. And every time that man did that, I wanted to punch him. Because <laughs> he scared me so bad. The one time, the first time that it happened, he collapsed in the floor at home. We called 911. We got him. I followed the ambulance to the hospital. And halfway there, they turned the lights off and the siren off. And I thought, oh no. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I can't breathe and I got to drive this car and get there. And we went to East and they didn't have room at East. So that was when West still had an emergency room. We went to West. And when I got there, they had him on a gurney in the hall because they didn't even have any rooms there. And all he kept saying was his name and social security oh, number. <laughs> He'd say, Timothy Mark Cannon, 494402. And I'm like, what are you doing, you know? Finally, he said, did you bring me to, to Lee's Summit or to research? And I said, honey, we are not in Kansas City. Oh, no. <laughs> We're in Iowa. He didn't know where he was. Oh. All he knew was his name and his social security number, which that wasn't the one I quoted. That was somebody else's. Um, <laughs> didn't want to put that on the internet, now did we? <laughs> um, so... There have been plenty of times when I've been afraid that I was going to be the widow. And these women were. Almost every one of them was left without a man. And then God stepped in and put them in the lineage of Christ. You ever noticed that Jesus, the men followed Jesus, but Jesus went to the women? Jesus went to Mary and Martha. Jesus went to Mary Magdalene. Jesus was there for the woman who touched his garment. But the men had to follow him. Because in Christianity, God doesn't, we are not second class citizens at all. God cares about us as much as he cares about any man. Um, I heard a, a pastor one time preach about the creation and with each step of the creation, he created a higher creature. And the last thing he created was a woman. Mm -hmm. yep, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> he finally got it right. <laughs> You know, um, at the cross, the last thing that Jesus took care of was his mother. That was the last. He said, John, behold thy mother, mother, behold thy son. Because he wanted to make sure that some, and he had four brothers. So I don't know what that, you know, but he wanted to make sure that John took care of her. Because Jesus cares about every little pain that we have. I had a traumatic childhood. There is a score called ACEs, and it measures childhood trauma. And I know this because with my children, they come with little scores. And uh, my son, Jesse, I think he has a 10 out of 10. Um, I have an 8 out of 10. But um, when I was 13, well, when I was 11, 12, I got saved when I was 5. And I was a bus kid for all those years and when I got to be about 11 or 12 I got to be an angry little thing I was mad because my life wasn't like everybody else's or I thought it wasn't like everybody else's um, I had a sixth grade math teacher who did wonders for me because she basically almost every day would pull me aside and teach me something new in order to take care of myself because I wasn't being taken care of and she told me you know yeah you drew a bad lot in life but it's on you what you do from here and uh, so I was I was a pretty angry little thing but then when I was 13 I, uh, I rededicated myself to the Lord and I had a spot in my closet literally 
that whenever I was completely overwhelmed with everything that was going on around me, I would go back in that spot and pretend to crawl up in Jesus' lap. And still to this day, I'm, I'm coming way too close to 60 years old, mm -hmm. but still my 60 year old self, almost 60 year old self, will climb up in Jesus' lap when I'm overwhelmed. And it's far too often that I'm overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I really should have gotten over it by now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because all through the Bible, and even in the Christmas story, Jesus points out how much he cares for those who've had a rougher time than anybody around them, or than most around them. He didn't, you know, let me think of someone who is in the lineage of Christ that I know. Sarah. Sarah didn't conceive until late in life, but Sarah didn't have a bad life. Sarah had, she died before her husband. Sarah had a husband who cared very much for her, took good care of her. Um, Rachel, Isaac's, uh, Jacob's wife, was well cared for and beloved by her husband. She didn't have a hard life. They don't mention those names in this lineage. They talk about Tamar. And uh, he talks about um, Ruth. I, I, I wonder at the, the fortitude of a Ruth because I don't know that I would have been that strong. I'm afraid that I'd have been Orpah and gone home. I don't want to think that I'd been Orpah and gone home. I've heard so many people say things like, well, if I'd have been at the crucifixion, I'd have stopped them. I'd have, uh, I'm afraid I wouldn't have. I'm afraid I'd have followed the crowd because I don't know that I'm strong enough to have resisted the crowd. And that thought horrifies me that I would have been screaming with everybody else. But how easy is it for us to get caught up and not be the one that is strong. But Ruth was strong all the way through. There's never a time when Ruth faltered, even though there wasn't anything in it or it didn't look like there was anything in it for her. And her mother-in-law says, well, now, this is what I need you to do. I need you to go in here. Why am I doing this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but she did as she was told and she wound up in the lineage of Christ. Poor Bathsheba. She just living her life being, you know, being a, the wife of a soldier. And all of a sudden, the king calls her in, gets her pregnant, and then kills her husband. And now here she is. She's got this baby. And I don't care who you are. You got the baby. You're going to hold the baby. You're going to stay with the baby and the, and the king. Um, and then the baby dies because of her, of her husband's sin. Oh, yeah, I think I slit his throat in the middle of the night. <laughs> but she wasn't in a position to do that. But then God gave her Solomon. And the Bible points out that God loves Solomon. So when you think about Christmas and when you look at that little baby boy laying in that manger, which is what most of us focus on at Christmas, I want you to remember the women that brought it about, the women that God chose to bring it about who were just like us, who had their failings, who had just hard things happen to them in their lives. I know that, that Bonnie lost a baby shortly after birth. Um, you didn't get to see her, did you? They took her straight to Iowa City. Yeah. That was the worst part, not being able to see her or touch her, even if she yeah. gone. Yeah. Yeah. I do have a picture of the pastor that was here at the time. He and his wife were, they did the service and he took pictures of her. Were you still in the hospital? Oh, yeah, because I had the C section. Yeah. Stay at that time, you had to stay in there seven days. Yeah. And that, and I had infection and stuff. And but here she is, going in a go. <laughs> I, I had another one 14 months later. <laughs> and this one. When we first married, we were married a year and a half. Uh, 17, 19 months later, I had Johnny. And then all these years, nothing until I was 37 when I got pregnant. I had her at 38. And unexpected, not really thinking because all that time, we never took any precautions, nothing. And then I got pregnant with her. And then we lost her. And then all of a sudden, I got pregnant with her. And the doctor said, don't have any. Don't get pregnant for six months. <laughs> it was about Oops. three, four months. <laughs> and not really trying. I mean, right. I did. Sure. And I, I prayed to God because, and 
I thank him because the loss of the baby. And I always had the thing, Philippians uh, 319, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And he gave me the strength to get through that because we didn't know why, what was wrong, because she was, they said about eight pounds. Uh -huh. That's why I had to have her C-section. Okay. And nothing in it, they said she had a diaphragmatic hernia where it went uh -huh. through and pressed up from here. Uh -huh. it, why, we don't know, but yeah, it was just, you know, and then to get pregnant again, I thought, oh. And the little rascal that came later. <laughs> I call her my mother. She calls me every day at home on her way home from work. Oh. I said, okay, mother. <laughs> so I make sure I'm doing okay. Yeah. And God loves, yeah. 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 and God loves mommies who lose their children, mm -hmm. and God loves mo uh, wives that lose their husbands, and God loves, okay, well, he just loves all of us, and, and that's what I want you to remember this Christmas. Now, I'm about to turn this off, and then we'll have a little bit more talk. <laughs> <laughs>